Today from the Wise News Network studios in Cherryville, North Carolina, it's Who Gives a Hoot number seven. Can y'all believe it's already number seven? No, I cannot. I think we started this back in the middle of summer. Yeah, yeah, averaging about one a month. Yep. So it's number seven. And as you can tell by our looks, Mason looks like an elf. <laughs> Only me. But no, we all look like elves. It's Christmas time, and Christmas is next week. And I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. And we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been up to the past couple of weeks. How we are. Well, let's see. One new story was a dispute between neighbors, and that was on County Line Road going into Kings Mountain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that was an interesting piece because there is a residence that has a berm built all the way around it. And so my wife was saying the law is going to be there one day. And I swear, you know, they were. Because this guy's dug, it's it's just a berm instead of a fence. It's a berm all around his house. So a dispute between neighbors. Mm. Mm -hmm. So if you're going towards Kings Mountain, it's on the left. Yes. And um, that was an interesting piece, too, because we found out about it through Facebook. And um, it was just, it was really quick work. I just emailed Gaston County about... um, you know, the reports, because we had a bunch of people in the area who drive through that way to get to work or to drop their kids off at school. And they were really concerned because there were multiple police vehicles on the road at that time and um, nothing had really come out about it. So we jumped at the opportunity to reach out to Gaston County PD and kind of get the scoop about what was going on. It did involve a shooting. Um, However, luckily, no one was injured and the suspect was apprehended. It was just a firearm discharge, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Moving on to another topic, which was sad, is Walker Reed. uh, The Gastonia mayor passed away, and he had been having some health problems, I Mm -hmm. I think. And so um, our hearts and prayers are for him and the family. And so he was very instrumental in getting a lot of stuff done in Gastonia. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. He was one of Gastonia's few African-American mayors that they've had, and he was absolutely instrumental. And um, I live in Gastonia, so I can definitely say that the city was very rocked by his unfortunate passing. And um, like Rusty said, thoughts and prayers with his family and his friends and everyone who he touched. Moving right along, we, we've we got Piedmont Lithium gets a permit extension. And, of course, this has been going on for years. Um, Grace, you probably can speak to that a little bit as far as what the in- extension entailed. Absolutely. Um, so their extension, first, I want to I wanna start this off by saying it is pretty common for um, companies who are attempting to get a mine up and running, it is pretty common for them to acquire these extensions because the mining permit application process is very in-depth, very thorough, and oftentimes original plans aren't able to work out. The state will say something like, oh, hey, I think you need to add this to your plan in order for it to be better, like more protection to the environment or the community. And so in this situation, I believe something like that happened. Piedmont Lithium made the decision to ask for this extension so they could alter their waste rock plan. Um, Originally, they intended to use clay liners for their waste rock pits. Um, However, they decided since to use synthetic liners, which will ultimately help protect the environment around the Piedmont Lithium site from potentially being exposed to harmful chemicals. These synthetic liners will prevent any kind of acid leaching or any kind of unwanted runoff into the environment. So I think that it's definitely a good thing that they got this extension so that they can kind of do their due diligence to make sure that what they're doing with the waste rock is all in order and, um, you know, I'm glad to see that it happened. And luckily, also, it won't affect their timeline too much. Um, a few extensions that they've acquired in the past have affected their timeline. But according to Erin Sanders, um, she emailed me. We had a little bit of correspondence back and forth about this. And she said that their timeline is still intact, hoping to start um, 
getting those permits approved in 2024. So that's coming up soon. And then just to clarify, because I need the clarification myself, the uh, liner is also going back in the pits whenever they put the waste rock back into it. It's not just something that's going to be present where they're storing the race waste rock during the process. I was worried about that myself. Well, it's an ongoing story. You know, it's been going on for years and it's still going through the process and we'll keep you up to date. When we learn more, you'll learn more. So stay tuned on the Piedmont Lithium uh, situation at, and how it progresses. Mm-hmm. And Janice Hovis was sworn in at the last city council meeting. So we were there and we filmed that. So Janice was sworn in, John Abernathy, and H.L. Beam, the mayor, was sworn in. So those mm-hmm. three were sworn in. Two incumbents went back in, and then Janice defeated Malcolm Parker for that seat. And so she's up there, and uh, we'll see how that goes. A, a little, a slight change in, in leadership. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how it goes. Janice yeah. is actually Mason's cousin, so <laughs> it was kind of a Beam family reunion in uh, the city council meeting that day. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm related to a lot of people because I'm related to Janice. I'm related to Jill. Me and HL got the same last name, so we're probably related somewhere along the lines. Um, <laughs> everywhere I go in Cherville is a Beam family re- reunion. <laughs> what I like is the the Beam Beam. The Beam Beam married a Beam is a Beam, and they have, like, first name, two Beam middle names, and then a last name. We got Georgie Beam Beam. That was my great-grandmother. And there's one more set of Beam Beams in Cherville. Is there a Beam Beam Beam? I hope not. <laughs> Comment down below if you're Mason's cousin. If you're a Beam, <laughs> are you a Beam Beam Beam? A triple Beam. Uh, <laughs> are you a triple Beam? There's um, double Beams. <laughs> uh, I'm the last one in the governor's lineage. That's what I am. Well, there is DNA tests tell a lot these days. So good, the bad, and the ugly. So anyway, if you're a beam, 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 or a triple beam, we might interview you. Yeah. <laughs> um. Also, the NASCAR Dash series. We finally completed that series. It's a four part series. And uh, a lot of uh, got a lot of great response on that. It was pretty neat to do that. We got all four out. We had some technical dif- difficulties, but a lot of times, if it's if you see us put a video up and we take it down, sometimes YouTube doesn't agree with our content. Sometimes their their computers don't uh, match up. So, and we try to put out quality content. So sometimes if we if you see something put out and it doesn't get rendered correctly on YouTube then it may get taken right back down. And it's been happening more often lately because that happened also with the uh, re-upload of parade piece that we did. Uh, Whenever I look at my original file on the computer, the audio's right on that one. But towards the end, if you go look at it, it, we're... We're we're speaking Chinese. Yeah, our lips ain't synced up. It's like, you know, (laughs) you're talking, but, you know, your lips are not matching. But that happens a lot in news. If you ever notice, a lot of times things are shot in two stages. You shoot the video and you're recording, and that has to match up. Yeah. And a lot of times in news, they just don't match up. Yeah. Even so, in here, these microphones are not hooked into that camera that's recording us. Yeah, so. yeah. So, I mean, there's multi-layers. We're, we're doing, you know, there's actually three or four files going right now, mm-hmm. and then that file, and that file, that file, and there's next thing you know, you've got 10 files you have to put together. So it's pretty neat, and Mason does a great job. A lot of equipment, and that, that all has to match. And technology, you know, uh, is great when it works. When it works. And the beast is still running. Oh, yeah. It, it uh, keeps that room hotter. You notice that? Mm-hmm. The beast running is like a heater. I'm still cold in there. I had to take the uh, thing off the vent today. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I mean, they're going to think we're crit mining or something. Over here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we have several computers. I don't know. We're up to four, I think, now and all kind of stuff. But anyway, um, the Christmas parade. Let's talk about the Christmas parade. We started dry yeah. and ended soak and wet. The yeah. minute they started moving, though. The second trip, 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 trip. Mm-hmm. And we're, ta- we're talking about the Cherryville, North Carolina Christmas parade yes. that we were in. I um I didn't even realize how soaked I was until the end of it when I took off this hat here you're seeing and um, a ring around my head where the hat was on was completely dry. And then the rest of my hair 
it was soaking wet. It was crazy. Well, at the beginning, it was a little misty. And, you know, of course, we checked the weather. The weatherman said, oh, it, you don't have to worry about rain till that afternoon or that night. Mm-hmm. You know, and weathermen, it's like you never have to be right. You don't. And it's like we, we had a tent that we could have put on the trailer. We had a cover that we could have put on the camera. And we just thought it was going to be a slight miss. And by the time we got to the end of the parade, it was coming down pretty good. Mm -hmm. And what Rusty means by putting something over the camera is I had finagled it to the top of the van. If you saw that in person, I'm proud of myself for that. That took some thinking. But it, I was looking back like twice every minute, just like worried about the camera during the parade because it was coming down. And I was just like, well, we're getting ready to get a new camera because I figured it's ruined. But it 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 hung in there. It, it did, did okay. Which was crazy because whenever I got back to the office, I turned the camera upside down and water just started like pouring out of the cracks. Mm-hmm. And uh, I honestly didn't know if it was going to run again. But I got back after the weekend was over and flipped it on. And it was just fine. Yeah. But we had a good time at that um, parade. And it was a different view because you actually could see the people watching the parade. Yeah. It's like you're you in know, it from our view. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, it was a great parade, a little wet, but there's a good turnout. And it went backwards this year. Mm-hmm. You know, it started on First Street and went over the bridge and then came from the west to the east. And uh, at the parade, time to plug our merch a little bit, we were throwing out these. If you want one of these, you can get them online at wisenewsnetwork.com. And uh, everyone wanted one, so I know you do too out there. Yeah. Go get them. Yeah. I think I accidentally hit a few kids with the with the microphone, but luckily they're foam, not anything hard, so it was fine. But we have hats and T-shirts and stickers and all that good stuff. And you get a sticker whenever you buy something. And mm-hmm. if you buy over $100, you get free shipping. Yes. And shipping's getting high. Mm-hmm. It costs more to ship that thing. Yeah. I mean, it was ridiculous how much it cost. The, the ship, one little quarter of a pound... It's like eight fifty or something. I mean, yes. it's just crazy, mm-hmm. you know, how much shipping. And I think the Postal Service is going up January 1st again, I think. I mm-hmm. saw that. Wow. And, you know, there's actually – I was talking to one of my friends about it outside of work. It's kind of funny. The, the flat rate boxes, the smallest one, it it's rated for up to 70 pounds where you have to do mirrored mail. There is no substance – heavy enough or dense enough that you can put in there outside of star matter. Oh, that would make it that heavy. Yes. Oh, star matter. Yeah. That's another <laughs> topic. That's another topic. But the prey, it made sense. I know Mary Beth Tackett explained why they did it that way. And a lot of the parade lined up on depot street. Mm-hmm. So when a train would come through, it mess up the, the parade. Yeah. So now with it starting the way it is and going around, even if a train comes through, it doesn't bother the parade route. Yep, because we're going over the bridge. Yep. Additionally, um, I think there were some issues with road closures as well. Um, in the past, with the way that the parade used to run, many like pretty main and important roads to this area would have to be closed for a pretty extended period of time. But with this new route, it was good because only Main Street was closed from 10 to 12 during the hours that the parade was running. So it didn't disrupt disrupt um, the regular flow of traffic hardly at all. Yeah, I think First Street was technically closed, uh, Mm -hmm. but there were cars going up through it, dropping kids off. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it worked out fine. I I didn't, it it was fine. It was fun. Yeah. I spent most of it um, being chased by someone's child and getting pelted with microphones. You loved it. Patrick, if you're watching this, (laughs) I'm getting you next time. But if you're a season parade thrower, you'll know how much to throw out because, and I didn't quite know this year because of the crowd. And we actually had some people ask us, well, how much candy do I need? How much merchandise do I need? And you kind of have to, you don't throw it all out to begin. And so you had to kind of pace yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell the green parade throwers or the giver out, they're they're out halfway through. So Mm -hmm. I made it to three fourths. Yeah. I made it all the way to about the end. Yeah. Yeah, I knew the way y'all were giving them out, you were going to run out. Me and Patrick ran out quick. It's just so hard. So many kids were like, can I have one? I'm like, I'm not just going to look at them and be like, no. And I would see siblings, and I have three siblings, so I know very well how it goes when one sibling gets something and the others don't. It's usually a bloodbath. So whenever I saw 
it's siblings or even just a group of kids conglomerated together, I was like, okay, we're not, we're doing mom and dad a favor. We're giving all of you microphones. Yeah. <laughs> and I tried to not skip out. I tried to skip over some of the ones that had already gotten sparky light bulbs. Mm-hmm. Cause they already had a stress ball. And I'm like, I know, I know the microphone's cool guys, but <laughs> yeah, but we gave out a couple thousand. Yeah, uh, pieces of uh, merchandise, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So hopefully everyone got one. If not, maybe you'll get one next year or you can purchase one and uh, we'll have them. And if you want to purchase one, you can come by and purchase and save the shipping if you want to. Yes, you can. 1242 Shelby Highway at our studios and get one. Save on shipping. Next is the vending machine story that you guys did. And it was cool. Tell us a little bit about that one. It was very cool. Um, So if you remember, a couple of months ago, we went to Morganton and we did a story on a proposal for an affordable housing project that the Burke County Public School District was attempting to do. And those same folks reached out to me and Mason about um, this really cool project that their educators have undertaken about, um, it was about a year and a half in the making, and they brought a vending machine filled with books to their school. And it's really cool. And something that we're going to try to do a little bit more of in the future is try and link our local stories with a national appeal. So when this story was pitched to us, I was thinking, how can we make this a bigger picture story? And I have a lot of friends who are going into the education industry. They um, are finishing up their degrees and starting to become teachers. And A lot of them have talked about the same issues that they're seeing. Um, Kids since COVID are having a particularly hard time getting caught up in school. You know, um, these young kids, they lost, uh, the studies say it's up to half a year, half a year's worth of education. Even though they were doing Zoom classes and um, virtual learning, they still technically lost half a year of where they should be. And so a lot of these kids are having a really hard time catching up and reading and maths in particular are taking a big hit. So this book vending machine is a perfect initiative to get kids excited about reading and to hopefully encourage some putting more books in the homes and encouraging more kids to get back into reading like they used to before COVID. And that was the uh, secondary point of the book vending machine is that Morganton and the area that the school's in has a high poverty rate. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of homes where the kids just don't have access to books at home. And the way the vending machine works is they complete a task or they do something exemplary. Nope, I'm going to give up on that word. Exemplary. Exemplary. There we go, There we go, that's close enough. Yeah, that thing Grace said, they do that. Uh, (laughs) And then they'll be awarded a coin that goes in the vending machine. And they get to go pick out their own book, and they can take it home with them. They never have to return it to the library or anything. And one of the more interesting things about the student population there, especially for elementary schoolers, is uh, they actually, the librarian says they're more into the nonfiction stuff. Mm-hmm. They, they crave reading about things they don't understand about the world. So they've got a little, they've got a mix of everything in the book vending machine. It was really nice. There are lots of other news people there. Do you want to talk about the other news people, Grace? We're going to keep our mouth shut about that. What are we going to do? Oh, my goodness. No, there was nothing. Okay. There was nothing crazy. Everybody was over, fighting over the story. Yeah, that's I all mean, it was. You have to imagine this, um, us news folk, we're hungry. And uh, when you're when you're at, when you're somewhere and you're shooting um, and there's other people there, you're all kind of vying for, like, the best spot. I, myself, I'm a five foot three like slightly smaller individual and uh most people are taller than me so to get these good shots I was like having to stand on my tippy toes put my put the rig in the air trying to get some good shots but it was all it was really fun I really enjoy going up there and um this is just my opinion of what we've seen from the Burke County School District so far but I'm really inspired by how dedicated that school district is to their teachers and their students. Um, I'm not saying that other school districts aren't um, because it's very hard to be 
like supportive, especially in these times that we're in post COVID. But every time we talk to the Burke County School District, I feel so warm inside about how encouraging they are and how much they care about their population. I know it seems like we lost two years of, of our <laughs> lives during COVID. We were talking about that off mm-hmm. camera and it's like, it will be 2024 week after next. And it, and it seems like COVID was 2020, 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it seemed like we lost a couple of years. Just, we just, and I know the educators had a hard time and students had a hard time. And the parents. And I don't know if, if kids really read anymore. I mean, when I see articles, it tells you it's a two minute read. Mm-hmm. And once I start scrolling down, even I, articles I read, if it's past two or three pages, I'm like, I ain't got time for this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's good to see kids read again and having devices like that or a machine that the, that they get a kick out of picking a book. And uh, I think there's a lot of those machines have being installed around the country. There yes. are. Yes, it's a it's a pretty big movement right now. This was interesting. Um Star Bowman or Bowman, the librarian who we spoke with, she said that most of their kids didn't even know what a vending machine was, even mm-hmm. one filled with snacks because um a lot of them were really young when COVID happened, really weren't in public spaces with vending machines, and a lot of them did not even know like what a vending machine was at all. Wow. Yeah. There were some of them that were up there it was their first time ever having to go, you know, hit a three, you know, or whatever they hit. Um, so, and that back to Rusty's point though, with the kids reading my own personal pet theory on that is it's like, I, I think they're just used to intaking information differently. They're used to being able to type in whatever they want to YouTube and they just, there it is. There's the information. So it's not that I think reading is unnecessary at, at any factor. I just think the kids have gotten so used to being able to get whatever information they want from Google or from YouTube like that, that a lot of them, because I know with my son, they, they just don't see the point in reading something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think eventually our education system is going to have to revamp because you know we're still using the same arithmetic, reading, writing, arithmetic, as we did 50 years ago. And, and those days are slowly going by the wayside. I mean, I think society's getting dumber because <laughs> the computers are thinking for us. Yeah. And it's so easy to do anything. I mean, you can do math, read it, just anything. AI read it for you. We haven't. It's just crazy what's happening. You haven't had to know how to spell a word since 2007. Yeah. I and I look at words and it's like, I'm having to check myself. I'm, t- I'm talking about simple words. Mm-hmm. It's like, does that look right? Yeah. And I, I don't know because we don't write enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's a different kind of intelligence too because um, obviously I don't think I'm, – I'm not a scientist, so I don't know, but I don't think like brain capacity and information, I guess, download of your brain, like I, I don't think that's changing. I just think that this is the first generation – the kids who are like in elementary school right now is the first generation – to be born really where the internet hasn't been at least somewhat new and up and coming. Like even when I was born in 2001, obviously the internet existed, people had computers, but it wasn't what it is now. There wasn't social media really. There wasn't, you know, YouTube came around in like 2006, I think. So, you know, when I was born at least, you didn't go on YouTube to get that kind of information. But the fact that like even three-year-olds are able to type in a computer and watch a video, I think that, first of all, it scares me a little bit. And then second of all, I think that that exhibits a just a different kind of intelligence because I couldn't type until I was like 12, like fluently. And these kids are clacking away before they're even in elementary school. I was mm-hmm. clacking away on an actual typewriter course <laughs> in high school. Yeah. With the bah, 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 bah. Yeah. Bring them back. My dad used a typewriter until 2005. He held out. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, AI is scary. Elon Musk said the biggest threat to society is AI, and I think it is. He's building the Neuralink. Why, how, why does he care? <laughs> he just stirs up drama. He's a drama queen. <laughs> mm-hmm. he, he likes to stir it up. So I don't know, but he says AI is the biggest threat, and he's, he's warning that it's coming. You know, so, I mean, we could actually be – 
what you think is us sitting here talking, it wouldn't be us. It would be a computer generated of us. We actually have enough hours of voice clips to do that. No, we don't want to do that. Don't Comment do down that. below. Yeah. Do you think we're deep fakes right now or are we sitting here? I am. My wife thinks I'm fake sometimes. <laughs> as, are you human or not? I say you humans aggravate me. <laughs> No, but uh, yeah, it's all in fun. But really, AI is it's scary. But I use it. You know, sometimes uh, I'm trying to do something and I'll test it out. So I don't know. We shall see. And speaking of kids and playgrounds and all that good stuff, we went just got back from the Westgate mm -hmm. Park Grand reopening. Yes, we did on West Carroll Street here in Cherville, the extension, and. Um, They've resurfaced all the uh, the roads going in, the parking spaces, at pickleball courts, mm -hmm. basketball court. Uh, they've re looks like they reconcreted concreted the area where the shelter is, mm -hmm. the picnic area, and so it's pretty cool. Yeah, and they did mention they have a few more improvements to get done before spring. Mm -hmm. um, and like we were talking about off camera, there's still plenty of space to be doing extra things there. Yeah, there's plenty of space there. And they may put a playground and some other stuff. You know, and you know, Piedmont Lithium helped them out on that and I think the city put money into it. But, you know, Piedmont Lithium's getting them a half a million dollars a year for 20 yes. years for that, recreation. That's a lot of money. They're going to have to they'll they'll try to find places to put that money mm -hmm. because as small as Cherville is, there's not a lot of recreation you could put that in. A half a million a year. You My know. vote's on getting that koi pond back there talking about it. it's supposed to be up there. <laughs> a koi pond. I, yeah, did you I, not hear that? Yeah, I, I, I told you guys about it. Yeah, I remember it being there. What do you do with a koi pond? You feed them or just... Yeah, you the, just look at them. Koi are so cool. They get huge. They mm -hmm. really do. They get huge. And they're so such beautiful fish. Maybe we can get some of the, the rare color morphs up at the Biltmore house. Mm. Yeah, I remember the koi pond being there. Um, and that was a very nice part. See, when Cherville was... A lot of those parts were built in the 60s and 70s with, when Carolina Freight was here, and it was just booming. And every, every neighborhood pretty much had a park because, actually, kids used to go out and play, believe that or not. I, I do. But mm -hmm. now, back to the children, people don't go out and play like they used to. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have video games, and we played till the streetlights came. But Cheryl's always been a rural community, so people didn't really need a place to walk their dog. They didn't really need a place because you could go in your yard. So it being rural, the parks were nice, but they were not a necessity to where you get in New York City and in the middle of Charlotte. You you need parks. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done a lot of research, actually, um, back when I was in school about uh, the walkability of an, er of an area and um, why parks and walkable areas are so important for metropolitan areas is because there's really nowhere for a kid to go outside and exercise in a suburban or like rural area you have kids riding bikes scooters rollerblading running around playing tag but in a city you can't do that or you risk your life getting hit by a car any a number of things could happen so Playgrounds are specifically important for urban areas to allow kids to go outside and get some exercise. And um, it's a big issue with playgrounds that are not up to code and that are breaking down. There, I think that there needs to be a push towards getting better up-to-date play equipment. Well, they are improving that, and Westgate looks a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you know if Piedmont continues to give that kind of money every year, you'll see – the small town of Cherry will have the best recreation around, and that area is also getting low-income housing, mm -hmm. apartments. It's also getting, I learned today, an RV park. Yes. Which the RV park is kind of, I don't know, I've heard mixed reviews on RV parks. You know, some of them are used for vacationing as a temporary housing situation, and some of them are a permanent housing situation. So the West Side is gaining some uh, attendance. I guess. Yes, the, it is. The population is getting ready to increase, and I'm sure there'll be people hanging out at the park, which will be good. You know, uh, you want activity. Yeah, 
And then as far as the rest of the recreational money goes, no, whenever Grace and I were up in Brian Dalton's office interviewing him, we did, he did mention that they're maybe thinking about some trails eventually. Mm -hmm. I would love to see all the parks in Cherville connected by walkable trails. Can we designate the city streets as walking areas for recreation so we can get them paved? (laughs) I mean, I'm going to lose a feeling driving on the streets of Cherville. I mean, I was riding around last night. We rode around last night looking at Christmas lights. And just in these neighborhoods, there's potholes. Mm -hmm. It's just, they're everywhere. And so... Let's designate, classify the streets of Cherubal as walking trails and get Piedmont to pay for them, <laughs> to pave them. Does that not sound like a deal? That's a yeah. good loophole. Maybe. And they're going to have to put sidewalks on the west side because, yeah. you know, you, you add that many people, they're going to be walking the food line. Mm-hmm. I guess they'll be walking through the woods and across the railroad track, and they need sidewalks. I think they need to just put, go ahead and put one straight through the back. I mean, there needs to be sidewalks because – you, you populate this side of town, people are going to be walking to the grocery store mm-hmm. and the shopping center, and they need a place to walk. And then the research and the studying that I've done on um, just kind of urban development, um, one of the biggest things that are important for low-income housing specifically is walkability because you have to think that some of those folks might not have access to vehicles regularly. And um, a lot of them could also have disabilities that would prevent them from using vehicles. So for low income housing, walkability is pretty vital. Well, from where they're building these apartments, there's n- it's not walkable to downtown unless they add sidewalks. Mm-hmm. It's not walkable at all. Right. It's not necessarily far, but Without the sidewalks, you know, they'd just be walking in the road, which isn't safe, of course. But, yeah, I mean, they have Main Street paid, but it's time to uh, get the rest of the, you know, roads paved. The paving at that park did look very nice. Yeah. Um, they just paved it, and it, it looked really great. And then still on the sidewalk situation in Cherival, I know everyone in this town loves their giant trees. Well, we did until the micro burst. But... There are so many places where the sidewalks just destroyed because of roots. Yeah, it's buckled up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think a lot of places in Cherville, they ha- there's no right of way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like the right of way is at the curb, and so when the, the city goes putting in sidewalks or pipes or anything, they have to acquire that right of way. So that may take some doings there. North Carolina, I think, is a state that's hard to get right of ways. Up north, they just take it. You know, if they want something, they'll take it in 30 days, they have it. But down here in North Carolina, you can get it, but it takes more uh, red tape to get right of ways. They just, they just, you know, put intimate domains up north and say, we want it, and they take it. <laughs> that, that happened with, like, Cisco and some other plants. They just took land. And, wow. Yeah. New Jersey, I think it was, maybe. That sounds right. <laughs> and so it's going to be a nice park. Um and they're putting a dog park. That was going to have a dog park. Mm-hmm. But then they're saying the dog park's going to go near the gym. Yes. Yeah. So when the gym and it, it was awarded at the last uh, council meeting. And they say there's going to be built in 200 days. So that should be done middle of next year. Yeah. Well, by the middle of next year, we're going to have a gym, a bar, a couple of places. Yeah. I saw a bar uh, right up the road here. It's called something on the corner there beside the vape job. Oh. Yeah. I didn't realize they're reopening that building again. Yeah, it's called some, I don't know what it's called. Well, good luck to everyone. I saw them hanging a sign up there. Good, good. Lots of new development coming to Cherryville. I mean, there's the low income housing, there's the housing developments, there's the bars. If you want to move to Cherryville, I think now would be the time to do so. Yeah, a lot, lot happening. A lot yeah. Going on. Um, and so this is probably our last Who Gives a Hoot before next year. I'd say so. Because we're going to take some time off over the holidays. And so I want to wish everyone a happy New Year and a Merry Christmas. And we have the New Year shooters coming up. Yes, we do. And if you're a native to Cherville and you're new to the area, this is your first year and you ain't been here since January, get ready for some explosions. Yes, it's loud, and I know it aggravates some dogs and cats, but it's unique to Cherville, so it's coming uh, the, the new people into Cherville, you're going to hear some loud bangs 
you know, around New Year's, so be prepared for it. And um, so we'll see. Yeah, two groups. One group is starting at City Hall, and the other group is starting at Blatt's Grill. And then one group uh, ends at the stadium at 6.30 that evening oh. on New Year's Day. So. If you want to see the shooters come out, and we'll probably video some of it. We'll see how it goes, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll probably do a segment on it. Did one last year, and we'll just see. We'll put something together. Maybe long, maybe short. We don't really know yet. We'll figure it out. I'm going to get near the dangerous end of the muskets, though, for uh, for some good shots. No, so. you're not getting hurt. I'm, I know. I, I, they just Sometimes they blow up. I know, <laughs> but you don't need to be two feet away from it. But those are where the good shot is. Yeah, but <laughs> don't, don't risk your life getting the shot. <laughs> getting the great shot. Rusty, cameramen are invincible. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, just be safe. I will. Everyone be safe over the holidays, and we do wish you a Merry Christmas and a happy 2024 New Year's, and we'll see you in 2024. I'm Rusty Wise. I'm Mason Beam. And I'm Grace Smith. And from Who Gives a Hoot number 7, from the Wise News Network studios, have a great day.